Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for this time. Uh, we thank you for this, your word that teaches us and refines our minds and our hearts to really long for and see who you truly are. So, Lord, we ask today uh, that you would further uh, just fill us with the truth and the knowledge of who you are, God, that we would truly uh, know you, that we would acknowledge you as God, and, Lord, that we would uh, just really long for you, that we would turn to you in humility and surrender. Lord, we know that uh, this work can only be accomplished by, by you and the work of your Spirit. So, Lord, we ask for you to just shape us now in accordance with your will and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been over a year now since uh, we've been on shutdown, at least in the U.S., for uh, in response to the COVID pandemic. And in some countries, even today, are in the worst conditions ever. India comes to mind. Um, let's continue to be praying for them and just uh, the tragic state uh, and not, not only India and other, but other places are still in, still trying to get on the other end of this terrible pandemic. Um, here in the U.S., seems things seem to be on the upside, where you know people are getting vaccinated, um, things are starting to open up again, life is starting to get back to normal. But even as this happens, um, I think it's important that. We don't forget about this last year, that we don't just trivialize uh, not only what happened last year in, a term, in the terms of how devastating it was for uh, just all of us in various ways, but the ways in which we were all shook by the pandemic itself. You know, no one was really ready for this. Uh, no country was truly ready for this. And I think it led to a lot of existential questions. Um, how do we understand these kind of natural disasters? Uh, what is the point of all this? How, if there is a God, why is he allowing these kind of things to happen? And uh, my goal today is to start answering this question. Uh, is there a purpose behind natural disasters? Um, and I think that our time in the Exodus narrative is actually a great time for us to explore how God interacts with our natural world as well as showing his sovereignty over both the natural and the supernatural. So as we ask this question, is there purpose behind natural disasters? And by natural disasters, I'm talking about everything from earthquakes to tsunamis to viruses, pandemics, epidemics, all the way to things like cancer and other diseases that seem to happen naturally, even though they are obviously unnatural because they are causing suffering and pain and death. What is the purpose behind these natural disasters? And I think first, I want to give us an overview of the purpose behind the 10 plagues. Uh, today we read about the warning of the 10th and final plague, which was the killing of the firstborn. What was the purpose behind these 10 plagues? Well, the obvious answer is the restoration of the Israelites. The Israelites were enslaved for over 400 years by the Egyptians. And not only were they enslaved, but they were oppressed to all kinds of crazy um, hardships. And including the, the attempted genocide of all the Hebrew male babies. The second purpose behind the 10 plagues was the divine justice of God upon Egypt for their oppression of the Hebrews. You see, God is the perfect judge. And even though there was 430 years of this, this uh, human oppression, God comes in divinely to bring judgment upon the Egyptians for the ways in which they have abused the Hebrew people. This includes the genocide of babies, as we talked about before, and if you actually look at the first and the ten, the last plague, um, it has direct connection with how the genocide of the Hebrews was commanded to be carried out. The third thing that uh, served as a purpose behind the ten plagues was God demonstrating the foolishness of idolatry. 
the foolishness of worshiping or, or revering anything as, as God or divine other than Yahweh God himself. Egyptians are known for uh, what we call now Egyptian mythology. Back then to them it wasn't mythology, it was their religion. It was polytheism. And throughout the series of plagues you have multiple gods and goddesses being exposed as being not only um, not what the Egyptians expected and worship, but they're exposed to be powerless against the hand of the Almighty Yahweh. Hapi, the Nile goddess, Hecht, the frog goddess, Ptah and Hathor, their cow goddesses, and of course, Ra, the sun god, sun god who, who provides light and, and, and life to all the earth, is exposed particularly in the ninth plague of darkness. Furthermore, you see the foolishness of Pharaoh, the idolatry of Pharaoh, right? You have Pharaoh seen as a god among men. And like many other monarchies uh, in the ancient times, the kings were seen as divine descendants. But you see Pharaoh not being able to actually be in control or have power over anything that God is doing through Moses and Aaron. And also you have the sorcerers and the magicians, the, the sages and the priests of the Egyptians. They're truly exposed as being impotent. They're, being, they're unable to actually help their own nation of e Egypt against the miraculous signs and wonders of this Israelite God. And last but not least, the purpose behind the plagues was for God to display his absolute sovereign power over all creation. Not just over the Israelites, but over the Egyptians. Not just over human beings, but over animals. Not just over living things, but things like rivers. Things like light and day and weather. God is in control of all of these. So going back to our question, is there a purpose behind natural disasters? At the very least, we know that natural disasters are used by God in the scriptures to remind people and creation who he is. They're always a reminder to us as human beings that we're actually not in control of our own lives. We're not in control of the status quo. We're not even in control of what the weather is going to look like. We're not in control of how crops are going to grow. We're not in control enough to stop tsunamis and earthquakes. We're not smart enough to prevent pandemics like COVID. We are not nearly in as much control or we don't nearly have as much power as we like to think and sometimes deceive ourselves into thinking. Natural disasters, including disease, Earthquakes and viruses are all under the sovereign domain of God's rule. These things have a way of reminding us that God is God and we are not. But a very common response to the proposition that there is a sovereign, almighty, all good being known as God, seen hand in hand with the disasters, disease, and suffering of mankind, oftentimes people become resentful, and they, they point the blame to God because in these times of natural disasters, we are so self-aware of how vulnerable we actually are, how fragile life actually is. And we realize we're not in control, but we do want to blame the one who is control. We do want someone to be responsible for all the negative things going on. And in this sense, we're half right when we resent God for the disasters that we encounter in this life. Because in doing so, we are half right. I'm saying that we are, because we are acknowledging that God is God. We're acknowledging that we are not. However, as much as it is half right, it is half wicked and therefore fully corrupted to resent God in the face of disasters because God is God. And we have nothing to gain from opposing him. If we're going to acknowledge that God is God by resenting him, we're contradicting ourselves. Because we're saying God is God, but I'm choosing to oppose him. 
We're saying God is all sovereign, that God is powerful, that he can change things, but at the same time, I don't want anything to do with him. See, the tragedy of sin, of our own sin, is that we find it more natural to resent God as a way of acknowledging him rather than repenting to God as a way of acknowledging him. Clearly, there's one that is right and the other that is wrong. Is there a purpose to natural disasters? Yes. Yes, there is. And as much as that is a hard pill for all of us to swallow, At the very least, the purpose behind it is to remind us that God is sovereign over all, both natural and supernatural. He's sovereign over all. Natural disasters are the occasion for us to be reminded how fragile, how vulnerable, how weak we truly are and how much we need to rely on God. Now, that is not a truth that always comes with joy. I myself, like anyone else who's lived long enough, have suffered the pain of losing loved ones, suffered the pain of seemingly senseless tragedies that happen. I'm not claiming that we'll figure out the in-detail reasoning and, and, and the logic behind all of those things. Those things remain to God. But these disasters these tragedies that we experience in this life, at the very least, from a big picture point of view, are meant to lead us to acknowledge God as God, as the sovereign one, and to repent and come to him humbly. So the sermon in a sentence for us today is don't let disasters lead you to resent God, but rather let them remind you that God is God. And that we need him. In verse uh, verse 1 of today's passage, the Lord says to Moses, Yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, and afterwards he will let you go from there. And when he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. There have been nine plagues up till this point, And God is now letting Moses know, Hey, there's just one more. There's just one more. And this plague is going to be different in nature because it's going to break Pharaoh's will. It's going to break the Egyptians' will to resist God. And not only are they going to let you go, but they're going to, they're going to want to drive you out. They're going to want you to just get out of their sight. Furthermore, God is restoring people in this process. In verse 2 and 3, you see that God gives the Israelites favor and he tells them, before they drive you out, make sure to ask your neighbors for silver and gold jewelry. See, God wasn't just planning to restore the Hebrews from their status of slavery, but he was also going to restore their wealth. He's restoring to them the things that had been taken from them, the things that had been uh, kept from them through the oppression of the Egyptians. I like to think of it in a way that God was, in a, in a, in a sneaky, covert way, administering a fine on Egypt for their crimes against the Israelites. But as we know, the payment for crimes can never just be absolved, can never be atoned through just through financial payment. In verses 4 to 9, God details the kind of punishment that is coming to the Egyptians and is going to be the death of the firstborn. You see, Exodus 1 details the kind of oppression that the Hebrews were subjected to for centuries. And here, there we have the record of them commissioning the genocide of all Hebrew male babies. And the final plague would be a fulfillment of what God had told Moses earlier in chapter 4. In verse 22 of that chapter, he says, Go say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So God had already warned them of this. And in many ways, the first and last plague, as I mentioned before, point us back to the incredible crime of attempted genocide upon the Hebrew people. The Nile was how uh, the people were told to kill these Hebrew babies, was to throw the babies in the Nile. In the first plague, you see the Nile turned into blood as a way of exposing what 
was the, the tragic crime that was committed on that same river. And the last plague, the death of the firstborn, is in many ways retribution for the children that were killed by the Egyptians. And verse 10 tells us Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people go. See, through these plagues, including the tenth plague, God is exposing the foolishness of idolatry and revealing who he truly is. He's exposing that Pharaoh, who was seen as a god among men, powerful and in control, as much as he is not going to let go of the power and control he has, that his own heart is in the hand of God. That God can harden Pharaoh's heart, God can soften Pharaoh's heart, but God chooses to harden his heart to reveal the fullness of his plan through the ten plagues and the deliverance of his people. God caused ten plagues for the Israelites, for them to know who he is, but also for the Egyptians to know who he is. At the time of the tenth plague, it tells us that the people of Egypt had gotten to the point of fearing and acknowledging Yahweh as God. Albeit it took ten plagues. Albeit it took even the death of their firstborns. But to the end, Pharaoh remains unrepentant. Of course, these plagues were special. There's no comparison of them that are happening today. And even throughout history, God does use uh, famine and different kinds of of disasters as a a way of of passing judgment and revealing himself to people. But the ten plagues were special in that sense. But we do know that at the time of Jesus' return, there's going to be the closest thing that we see to the ten plagues. In the book of Revelation, it tells us about the incredible wonders of God that are going to be terrifying and tragic and even bloody in so many ways leading up to the final judgment of God in Christ's return. God uses natural disasters to warn us, to remind us, to show us our need for repentance, our need to surrender and acknowledge Him as God, which is something that the Egyptians failed to do. I want us to think about this example as I close. Imagine that life is like living on a boat that you built. You build this boat to the best of your ability. You build this boat to stay afloat on water, so of course you don't drown. But because we are, in, because we are flawed, because we are messed up, because we are broken, because we lack knowledge, because of all the reasons that make us human, We might have the ability to put a boat together, but at the end of it, that boat is going to start sinking. And you're, of course, you're the captain of this boat. And your ship is sinking. Now, this this option comes out of nowhere, where a lifeboat comes to save you. A lifeboat comes to save you from your sinking ship. But on this lifeboat, you can't be the captain. On this lifeboat, you have to just be a passenger because the captain knows better than you and the captain has others to save too. So you don't get to run this lifeboat once you decide to jump on it. The tragic thing is that many of us, because of our sin, in a spiritual sense, we will reject the lifeboat to stay on our own ship and die as captains. Would you rather be the captain of a sinking ship or a passenger on a floating one? See, Jesus is the captain of the lifeboat. God sent his son not to send people to hell, but he sent his son to save people that were already headed to hell. We are all guilty and in need of God. And God uses all things around us, not only preachers and Christians and messengers and signs and wonders and dreams, but he also uses 
tragic disasters at times to remind us that the control and the power that we covet and that we protect so much, the way hero, I mean, the way Pharaoh did with his control and power over the, over the Hebrews, that is ultimately not worth it. And it's ultimately insignificant. It's an, it's an illusion of power when in fact only God has the power. We've all built our own ships. They will all fail us. But with God and in Christ, we can be saved. This is gospel. And the death of the firstborn son is no small thing. It shows us how it shows us how agonizing. We're going to talk about that the tenth plague next week. But how agonizing do you think it was in Egypt? The scriptures tell us that there was a loud cry that came out in despair and agony over the death of the firstborn throughout the land. How different do you think that agony of a parent mourning their child was for God the Father mourning the death and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? But yet God did so. Yet God did so because He loves us and He wants to save us. And He will save us. In Christ, we have everything to gain. Apart from Him, we have everything to lose. Whatever we think we own, whatever we think belongs to us, doesn't. Ultimately, God will not be denied. And it will be revealed and exposed that He is the only one who is truly sovereign. So let's not let the tragedies and the disasters lead us to resent God, even with this COVID pandemic. Let's not let this or whatever might come next from this lead us to resent God, but let those times be a reminder that God alone is God. And as painful and as harsh as that is, to think about that during a time of tragedy, it is those times that remind us how much we actually need Him. So let's turn to Christ. Don't be stubborn and die a captain on a sinking boat, but jump off that boat and cling to life in Christ, the true captain, the true savior, the one who will restore all things to us the same way God restored Israel from this slavery. We can be freed from sin and death in Christ alone. So let's turn to him be reminded how much we need him and how much God loved us by sending him to us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for the sacrifice and the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you, God, that there is purpose behind all things. And we might not know the details and the reasoning and the logic of all that, but God, we know that the one who is in control is good, is merciful, and is loving. We thank you that you offer us salvation in Jesus. We thank you for exposing the lies of, of our seeming power and control over our lives. We thank you for exposing that through things that are outside of our control to remind us how small, how weak, how vulnerable we truly are, and how much we actually need you. For God, you are in control. So help us to humble ourselves before you and not be stubborn to respond to your love in worship and, hum and humility. We thank you so much that we can do this through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.